So we are back in Matthew chapter 16, verse 4. It says this, A wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given unto it, but the sign of the prophet Jonah. And he left them and departed. As we have learned, the Bible gives us a multitude of signs to strengthen our faith and to help us be ready for the return of the Lord. As we heard last week, Jesus told us to watch. So what does this mean? If the Bible gives us all these signs and Jesus told us to watch, why is he now saying this? A wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. What does it mean? What I think it means is that these men wanted Jesus to do some trick or put on a show. I think primarily what it means is that they wanted him to work on their terms. But see, God works on his own terms. He's God. And he's revealed them to us in the Bible. God has already provided all the evidence we need through his word and through his creation. So to ignore and reject these and then seek after a sign is wicked and foolish. Not one person in history has ever sought God with all their heart and been disappointed. Instead of being stubborn and prideful, we have to humble ourselves. We have to do it God's way. Pride goes before destruction, but those that humble themselves shall be exalted. And I think that's the idea when he said a wicked and adulterous generation here seeketh after a sign. So again, in verse four, he says, he calls it an adulterous generation, an adulterous generation. And that is referring to spiritual adultery or spiritual fornication. These men claim to be God's people, but they were idolaters in heart. Now, listen to this statement. The Lord gave me this. Spiritual adultery today is when people who profess to be the bride of Christ are intimate with the world. Let me say that again. Spiritual adultery today is when those who profess to be the bride of Christ are intimate with the world. <clears throat> also, spiritual adultery is when professing believers are involved with any idolatry. This theme of bride and whore is all through the Bible. I'm going to start with Exodus 34 verses 14 and the first half of verse 15. God said this to Israel, thou shalt worship no other God for the Lord whose name is jealous is a jealous God lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land and they go a whoring after their gods and do sacrifice unto their gods and one call thee and thou eat of his sacrifice. Hmm. I meant to only read the first half of that, but anyway, we see that to worship other gods or be involved with any idolatry, God refers to that as going a whoring. And then in 2 Corinthians 11, 2, Paul the Apostle wrote this to the believers in Corinth. He said, I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. And then, of course, you know Ephesians 5, verses 30 through 32. For we are, speaking of the church, we are members of his body, and of his flesh, and of his bones. 
For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. So, like I said, we see this theme of spiritual adultery, the bride, a whoring. This, this theme runs all throughout the Bible. You know this one, James 4.4. 4. Ouch! Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Wherefore, whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Revelation 17, 1 and 2. <clears throat> there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication. And the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Of course, this is talking about the false church, which will be in power and dominate during the tribulation after God's true church is taken out in the pre-trib rapture. Now, this false church exists now, but it will be manifested and revealed completely during the tribulation once God's true church is gone. And then uh, lastly, Revelation 19, 7 through 9. We've talking about both aspects of this, both sides of this, the good and the bad. Well, here's the last one, and it's good. It says, let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. For the marriage of the lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he saith unto me, write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. So, in view of all that we have just heard, we have to ask ourselves. I have to ask myself. You have to ask yourself. Am I guilty of spiritual adultery? If so, then... We should repent today, confess and forsake our sins, and pray for God to help us be faithful to him because he's worthy. And unlike us, he is always faithful. You know, 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. See, he's faithful, and he will faithfully forgive us and cleanse us as his children. When we sin and we're aware of that sin, we confess it to him, and he says he'll forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness, and we will be restored to our fellowship with him. <clears throat> Deuteronomy 7, 9, and 10. Know therefore, I said God is faithful, right? Know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations and repayeth them that hate him to their face to destroy them. He will not be slack to him that hateth him. He will repay him to his face. And so we see God's not only faithful to love and forgive, he's faithful to judge and to punish, as Shai Lin says in one of his songs. Not only faithful to save, but faithful to judge. And then one more scripture before we move on in Matthew 16, and that is 2 Timothy 11 through 13. Uh, excuse me, 2 Timothy 2, 11 through 13. It is a faithful saying, For if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, 
he also will deny us. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful. He cannot deny himself. So yes, our God is faithful. He is the faithful God. And you and I as believers should be faithful so that we can hear those wonderful words. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Matthew 16, verses 5 and 6. When his disciples were come to the other side, they had forgotten to take bread. Then Jesus said unto them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. I want to draw your attention in verse 6 to the phrase, Take heed and beware. Beware. This is definitely a word for you and I today. If there was ever a time for us to take heed and beware, it is now in these perilous last days. These words, take heed and beware, remind us that this life is not a playground. This life is a battleground. So here's my question for you. Are you playing or are you fighting? Right? Everybody nods their heads and says, yeah, I like that. You're right. This life is not a playground. It's a battleground. Well, what are you doing? Are you playing or are you fighting? And this life is not only a battleground. As we were talking about earlier, this life is preparation for eternity. We really need to think about that word and that reality, and we should think and speak and live for eternity. This life is preparation for eternity. And the battle is for the eternal souls of men. The battle is not fought with carnal weapons because the battle is not physical. It is a spiritual battle. And the main weapons are God's truth versus Satan's lies. God has made man in his own image. While that image has been marred by sin, we still have the ability to make choices. It is true that men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. But that's why Jesus died on the cross, so that those who love darkness could be convicted and drawn to him. John 16, 8. Jesus said of the Holy Spirit, when he comes, he will reprove, convict, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. And in John 12, 32, if I can get it, John 12, 32, Jesus said, If I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all unto me. Let's look at some more scriptures that pertain to the spiritual battle that we are in. Now, I'm not going to go through every verse of Ephesians 6. We're, we're, in, we're in Matthew right now, believe it or not. But uh, we're not going to go through every verse in Ephesians 6. But I suggest, as a believer, that you study Ephesians chapter 6 for yourself as to what it says about spiritual warfare. So let me read Ephesians 6.12. Ephesians 6.12 says, We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness. So notice what it says in Ephesians 6.12. It says, it's not those people that you work with that get on your nerves, right? It's not the, the guy that cuts me off when I'm driving down the road, right? It's not uh, the hostile people. Now, don't get me wrong. All those things are real and they happen. But... Primarily, there's a spiritual battle happening. And if you're a believer, you're in it. And 
it says here that we're not fighting against the people that we see physically around us, but they, those people are being used, manipulated, and controlled to keep you as a believer from being what God wants you to be and doing what God wants you to do. They want you out of the fight. That's what the devil wants you out of the fight. And so he uses people. That's what it says in Ephesians 6, 12. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. Yep. That's, you look on the TV at the news for a minute, and you can see real quick, this is, this is real. This is true. Does, does that sound like our society? Rulers of darkness, the darkness of this world? Oh, yeah. Against spiritual wickedness in high places in the heavenlies, meaning in fallen angelic beings and demons are behind the scenes. How about Ephesians 6, 16? It says that you and I as believers... Again, I, told, I, I suggest you go study this for yourself, but just giving you something for this uh, point. And that is, it says, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. The shield of faith. Above all, take that shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Those fiery darts are lies and can only be quenched with the shield of faith. Great. How does that work? Second Corinthians 418 tells us, listen, second Corinthians 418. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal. The things which are not seen are eternal. How am I going to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked with the shield of faith? By living for eternity, thinking eternally, speaking eternally, walking for eternity, right? This is not it. This is not all there is. This is not where it ends. It never ends for us. We have eternal glory and joy and peace and blessing and God set before us. So how can we quench all the fiery darts with the shield of faith? By living for eternity. And that's what faith is, what we just read. Looking not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. That's faith. And that is how we use the shield of faith. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. You see that connection? Faith is the substance of things hoped for. By the way, hope in the Bible is not how we use it today in English. We say hope. Boy, I hope it, it doesn't rain tomorrow. I hope I get a raise. We, when we use that word hope, today. It has a different meaning in the Bible. In the Bible, hope means a confident expectation. Confident expectation. It's something that we know is going to happen. That's hope in the Bible. That's the hope that God gives. That's the hope believers have. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. 1 Peter 1. 3 through 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a living hope, a lively hope, by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that fadeth not away reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time praise God you really I hope you wrote that down and take it home and meditate on 1 Peter 1, 3-5, believer. 
meditate on that. Selah. But anyway, in verse 5, 1 Peter 1, 5, it says that you and I, as believers, are kept by the power of God through faith. We look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, kept by the power of God through faith. And then it says, unto salvation. Well, you and I are already saved. Okay. As you know, there's three aspects of salvation. Salvation is justification. Declared righteous before God happens in an instant at the moment. You, a person trusts in Christ and is born again. You're justified. Forever righteous in the sight of God. And we are saved from that moment. At that moment, from the penalty of sin. And then right now, you and I are being sanctified as believers. It is a process, sanctification. We're being saved by the power of sin, okay? And as we grow, and then lastly, saved from the very presence of sin, our sinful nature will be gone. That's what 1 Peter 1.5 is talking about when it says, kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. It means the redemption of our body. It means no more sinful thoughts, words, or deeds ever again. Praise God, Maranatha. So, back to the spiritual battle. Listen to 2 Corinthians 10, 4 through 5. 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. And these strongholds are lies. That's what the strongholds are, lies. And they must be pulled down by the truth of the word of God in the power of the spirit of God, the spirit of truth. Let me say that again. The strongholds are lies that must be pulled down by the truth of the word of God in the power of the spirit of God. And he is the spirit of truth. And of course, when it comes to spiritual battle, we can't leave out the critical part of prayer. Prayer. We must pray. We need fervent, spirit-led prayer. And the importance of fervent, spirit-led prayer when it comes to spiritual warfare cannot be overstated. Now, we know the Word of God is alive and powerful. Yet, sometimes people are like a brick wall when you speak the truth to them. I'm sure you've experienced that. And that is why... We must pray for what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 2, 4 and 5. He said this, My speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So you see there, he says, my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom and demonstration of the spirit and power. I pray that every day, that my preaching will not be with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and power. You and I must pray that the spirit of God will cause our preaching to be accompanied with his power to draw, to convict, to bless, to edify, to sanctify, and to save. You and I must put on the spiritual armor and keep on our spiritual armor with prayer. That's how you put it on and that's how you keep it on. Prayer. Ephesians 6.18 Praying always. Notice that after this whole list of the whole armor of God Paul says this last, he says, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit 
and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Sounds serious, right? Sounds hard, right? It's a battle, remember? It's not a playground. It's not a, it's a, it's not a playground, it's a battleground. Are you playing or are you fighting? Pray always with all prayer. I believe that means, first of all, pray always. Pray without ceasing, okay? Uh, we're in constant communication with God because after all, the Bible says walk with God, right? We're walking with him. He's with us all the time. We're with him as his children. And uh, that's what it means to walk with him. God's always there. I've heard you talk about that all the time. Uh, walking with God. He's with us. We should be talking to him. Pray without ceasing. But notice it says praying always with all prayer. I believe the words all prayer means all types of prayer. First of all, most importantly, devoted time of prayer that you set aside from your life every day to spend in concentrated, sober, focused, fervent, effectual prayer. But then also spontaneous prayer. Oh, and then simply walking with God and talking to him throughout the day. Something comes up, boom. Constant communication with the captain of our salvation. So, uh, and supplication, Ephesians 6, 18, all, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit. You and I need to be filled and led by the Holy Spirit so that we can pray in the spirit. And primarily, that's it's God doesn't make it complicated. It's real simple. Obedience to his word. And as soon as you're aware of sin in your life, confess and forsake it. That's what it means to walk in the light with fellowship with God. And not, not thinking about watching, listening to, and doing things that grieve and quench the Holy Spirit. But on the contrary, taking in the word of God and other good things, and being involved in other good things, doing the will of God, to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And of course, praying to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You have not because you ask not sometimes. And Jesus taught us that if we being evil know how to give good gifts to our children, how much more will our Heavenly Father give Holy Spirit to them that ask Him? And then of course, it says in Ephesians 6, 18, and watching, again, focus, watch, pay attention. It's a battle. We've talked about this before, right? If we were out in the war uh, on the battlefield and bullets were whizzing by, we'd be pretty alert, wouldn't we? Right? Now live like that spiritually. Live like that spiritually. We look not at the things which are seen, at the things which are not seen. Gird up the loins of your mind and be sober, the Bible says. And then it says, watching thereunto with all perseverance. Yep, it's in, we're in for the long haul until Jesus calls us or we go to him. Till we get raptured or through death, we got to do this with all perseverance. And I like the last part. He left, he brought the family, our brothers and sisters in. He says, and with all supplication for all saints. Don't forget, you're not alone in the battle. Your brothers and sisters in Christ are fighting with you and are suffering with you and need your prayers, right? So, supplication for all saints. And not just everybody in this room. Our brothers and sisters across this world are suffering persecution for righteousness sake and for his holy name's sake and for the gospel's sake. How, how, how often do you remember them and pray for them? Don't forget about them. They need your prayers and we need theirs too. <clears throat> so don't forget about your brethren, your comrades in the battle. So there's many more verses in the Bible concerning the spiritual battle we are a part of. I exhort you to study them for yourself, to be mindful always of the battle, and to war a good warfare for your captain of salvation, Jesus Christ. So do what Jesus said way back in Matthew 16, verse 6. Take heed and beware. Now let's move on to verse six again, Matthew 16, six. We got about 10 minutes left, so buckle on and put, put your armor on. Matthew 16, verse six. Jesus said unto them, take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Leaven it says, take heed and beware of the leaven. Leaven in the Bible is always a type of evil. 
type of evil doctrine, evil behavior, and corruption. Let's look at some verses. Now, we're already in Matthew 6. Look at verse 12. It says, Then understood they how that he bade them not beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. Like I said, leaven is a symbol of evil. Evil doctrine, evil behavior, and corruption. Here it is, it is evil doctrine. Uh, Mark 8.15. Mark 8.15. Jesus charged them and said, Take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. The leaven of Herod. What is the leaven of Herod? I believe it is worldliness and unbelief. Worldliness and unbelief. Think about Herod for a minute. Makes sense, right? Leaven of Herod. So you have the leaven of the Pharisees, Sadducees, and Herod. Herod, the leaven of Herod, excuse me, the leaven of Herod is worldliness and unbelief. In Luke 12, 1, it says, Jesus said, Beware ye of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Hypocrisy. Jesus said that he told us what the leaven of the Pharisees is, hypocrisy. And specifically, part of the leaven of the Pharisees was this, elevating tradition above the word of God. And according to Jesus, that makes one a hypocrite. And we're not going to go over that right now because we just went through Matthew 15 verses 1 through 9. If you'd like to hear the details of the uh, leaven of hypo hypocrisy as seen in elevating tradition above the word of God, you can find the study in Matthew 15 verses 1 through 9 on my YouTube channel. So, let me read 1 Corinthians chapter 5 verses 6 through 8. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 6 through 8. We're still looking at leaven, right? Evil doctrine, evil behavior, corruption. We saw the leaven of the Pharisees. Uh, we saw the leaven of Herod. Uh, we look, found out Pharisees' leaven is hypocrisy, elevating tradition above the word of God. And now we're going to look at 1 Corinthians 5. I'm going to read verses 6 through 8. If you want the whole context, you've got to read the whole chapter on your own time. Listen to 1 Corinthians 5, 6 through 8. Paul says, your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, for as ye are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Let us, therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So here, again, you can study this for yourself, but I'm going to give you the gist of it. In 1 Corinthians 5, leaven here is symbolic for the corruption of a local congregation through toleration of open and unrepentant sin. The leaven also in this chapter is symbolic of failure to practice church discipline and biblical separation. And if you study that chapter, you'll find that all there. I think I might have, might have got into this a bit more in detail when we went through Matthew 13 and the leaven parable of the leaven, which is also on the YouTube channel. So Galatians 5.9. Galatians 5, 9. We got five minutes left. Don't worry, I'm watching that clock. Galatians 5, 9 says, A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Again, without teaching the whole book. Here, leaven is the corruption of the gospel message, specifically by adding to it. <clears throat> While those who are really saved will do good works and keep God's commandments, we don't do those things to keep ourselves saved. 
We do those things because we have been saved. As I said earlier, excuse me, as I quoted earlier, we are saved and kept through faith. We walk by faith and we live by faith. Faith in Christ, faith in his word, and faith in the gospel. Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. Most of us know verse 16, but not 17. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Verse 17. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. You see that? It says we're saved by the gospel, right? But we're also kept by the gospel. Verse 17. From faith to faith, from start to finish, faith to faith. We don't do anything to keep our salvation. We didn't do anything to get our salvation. And we can't lose our salvation. The question is, are you saved? See, that's where the confusion comes in. It's called eternal life. It's called everlasting life. It's called eternal salvation. You can't lose eternal everlasting life. The question is, do you have it? And then the question is, how do you know you have it? Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. You know these, you should know them. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, for by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Right? As I said earlier, we're not saved by works, we're not kept by works. We are saved by faith, by grace through faith. We're kept by faith and we're saved unto good works for the purpose of doing good works. Faith without works is dead. And of course, 1 Peter 1.5, got to hear it again because it's so good. It says, we are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Almost done. So back to Matthew 16, verse 6. Another thing that this verse teaches us is that we have to be careful who we listen to. We need to be careful who we listen to. Listening to false teachers is dangerous. 2 Peter 2, 1 through 3 says this. There were false prophets also among the people, even as there be, shall be false teachers among you, who shall, who privately, privily shall bring in damnable heresies, damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many, this is happening today, many shall follow their pernicious, that means hurtful, their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. Is this not being fulfilled in our day? Why did, one of the reasons that Christians are considered to be such fools and idiots and, and wicked people is because of these false teachers and their false teachings. And this is exactly what God said would happen. Many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom, because of these false teachers and their deceived followers, the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. Oh, yeah, you born-again Christians. Yeah, you're a bunch of fanatics fall on the ground and, 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 and uh, want all my money. That's just what Second Peter told us this would happen. So make sure you're not a part of a church like that. And it says in Second Peter 2, 3, through covetousness. Listen to this. This is happening. Through covetousness. By the way, that reminds me. It's not all the deceived people. It's not the false teachers fall only. All their followers are just like them, and they want what they want. Not God. They want what they can get from God. See? Now listen to what it says. Through covetousness. Not only the covetousness of the false teachers trying to get the money from the fools, but from the fools that are covetous. And that's why they follow them, because they want what they want. As Paul Washer said, that's why 
uh, people. Joel Osteen gets the masses of people in his congregation. They want what he wants. Through covetousness shall they with feigned, that means insincere words, make merchandise of you. Make merchandise of you. Here, send me your hundred dollars and I'll send you this anointed handkerchief that I prayed over and you hold it and put it on your wound and you'll get better. They shall make merchandise of you. And that's a real thing, what I just said, too, from so-called Christian television. Well, guess what? It says their judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. Everybody's got a rude awakening. So, with false teachers and false teachings, a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Jesus said, take heed and beware of the leaven.